Welcome to Quilting on the Side, the podcast where we uncover the secrets to turning your passion for quilting into a profitable side hustle. I'm Tori from the Quilt Batch by Tori. And I'm Andy from True Blue Quilts. And together, we're your co-hosts on this exciting journey of creativity, entrepreneurship, and all things quilting. We're here to help you navigate the world of quilt pattern design, course creation, digital marketing, and running an online quilt business. We've been through the ups and downs ourselves, so we know what it takes to make money from your favorite hobby. That's right, Tori. We're going to share our experiences on how we've grown our businesses while balancing family with other paying work responsibilities. It's not always easy, but it's definitely possible. Hello, tonight we are here with Kim from Cotton Cuts, and I'm going to let Kim go ahead and introduce herself. So Kim, would you let, tell us a little bit about you and your business? Yes, thanks so much for having me, Tori. I appreciate being here. Um, okay, so I'm Kim Moose. I am the owner and founder of Cotton Cuts. Cotton Cuts um, was a teeny tiny little side hustle project for me about, um, I was looking at the, the calendar, and so by the time this airs, we will have hit our um, eighth birthday. Um, it started out as um, kind of, I wanted to do something different. I had a corporate career and I was bored in my day daily and decided, hey, let's create a business. And I was, I read a bunch of magazines. I taught myself everything about Facebook and creating a website. And six months later, I created this tiny little company called Cotton Cuts. And 10 minutes after I opened my website, we had our first customer. And so I thought, maybe, maybe there's something here. Maybe this is awesome. And so I kept just plugging away and evenings and weekends, we would cut fabric, um, we would fold fabric, we would ship fabric, we grew, I acquired custom, I acquired competitors. Um, we were up later, we watched It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia a lot. I started hiring employees. Um, they were coming to my house at all hours of the evening and weekends and my neighbors were getting suspicious. So after about about two years of, you know, being an evening and weekend in my basement, I quit my full time job and I went full time into Cotton Cups. We moved into um, the Chesterfield Mall. It's a mall here in St. Louis. That's one of those um, big vacant spaces, which basically meant real estate's really cheap. And um, when I moved in, they said, we're going to tear this place down in six months. Don't get too comfortable. And of course, as I was making this decision, I was like, I don't even know if I'm going to be around in six months. This sounds great. Um, and five and a half years later, we're still there. We're actually moving to a bigger space in a couple months here. And so um, it's been in a crazy adventure. Um, we have been around through a lot and seen a lot. And, um, and it's exciting. I can't wait to share kind of more details about the story with you guys. That's amazing. And I know we were talking before we started recording that you yourself are a quilter. So how were you introduced to quilting? Oh my gosh. So I started sewing when I was eight. So I had a crafty mom and a crafty grandmother and they were always doing craft shows and making things. And I was always the little one under the table that would make the little like tchotchkes and sell them for a dollar and you know I would make a quarter and my mom was making 75 cents all that good stuff um and so I started sewing when I was eight I made my first quilt when I was 13 and this is just something that has just been kind of part of my upbringing I would say when I started this business I wouldn't have called myself a quilter I would have just said yeah I occasionally quilt on the side um but as I was learning more about the quilting business I was like okay yes I guess I am a quilter now like I prefer of all the things I've sewn in my life I prefer to sew quilts over apparel um I, you know Tori you and I are both moms I've done the Halloween costumes and all that stuff I am give me give me triangles give me corners give me things that fit together geometrically and I will be a happy gal I can see my story correlating your own <laughs> I started sewing when I was nine I made my first quilt by myself when I was around 12 so it's mm -hmm. like and then the business, I really didn't consider myself a quilter until I decided to go into business. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what, do you remember what your first quilt was? I'm going to ask you a question. I, I do. I, it was a rag quilt. It was around the world style. And it was, I think I still have it. I do still have it. It's, um, it was turquoise, purple, and lime green faux fur. Oh. I had to have polyester fur and my mom was like that's not going to do the rag thing I'm like I don't care I love it 
<laughs> because so you probably went to like House of Fabrics at the time and got like that where they had like the dress and the sequins and the faux fur right next to all the quilting cottons was all mixed together. Exactly. So mine was an ocean wave belt, which um is a ton of half square triangles. And it was all blue and black. Blue and black because I didn't want to do white because white was you know something old ladies used. And so um and I made it into a quillo. Um that was a thing like in the eighties was to have a quilt that you could fold up and then have a sleeve that went over the top and it made a pillow so you could have a pillow and a quilt and a quillow yeah I think it still exists somewhere it might be in the basement but yeah that sounds like a perfect project for a 13 year old I think you said 13 yeah 13 yeah going to sleepovers got my own and I, we were on sports team and traveled so of course the pillow quilt it felt efficient I guess so along those lines what helped push you from being a quilter as a hobby to be turning it into a business. What was that motivation there? Right. So, um, like I said, I had this corporate job. I, I um, worked in pharmaceuticals for 20 years. I did a lot of really crazy, cool things, but I found myself bored and I read um, an article in the Fast Company magazine and it was talking about subscription businesses. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I have a couple hobbies. Maybe I can subscribe to something. And I didn't find anything for quilting, which I thought was odd. Like I, there were a couple boxes at the time. And I was like, I don't want to join any of these. These all sound horrible. And so I was like, maybe I can create something better. And I think that was really kind of the catalyst of me, um, you know, wanting to wanting to buy something, not finding what I wanted. And so why don't I create the products that I want to buy? Because I didn't feel like what I was seeing really catered to me. I am not the, you know, the stereotypical quilter who we love, you know, the 60 plus, nor am I the, you know, grand millennial in their 20s sewing. And I didn't find anything that really sang to me. And I was like, why don't I create something that would do that? And so that really kind of flipped the switch for me. I was, I'm a typical, I didn't see something I wanted, so let's create it. Oh, I love that. I think that's a very smart way to create a product is to use yourself as your own ideal customer. You don't see anything appealing to you, so you create it. That's really ingenious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, how, let me see. I've got like five questions here. I'm so excited to ask okay. you all of them. Uh, so how do you, how does Cotton Cuts work currently? Okay, so our current business, we ship about five to 6,000 packages a month all over the world. And so, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> five to six. So we have um, 18 employees that work for me. Some are part-time, some are full-time, some are production workers. So they're actually, you know, packing, cutting, shipping, everything that we send. Some do social media, some do customer service. And then we also have special projects group, like things that come up. We've got interns. So we have about 18 employees that work for me in total now. And so um, of the 5,000 packages, some are traditional subscription boxes, some are projects, some are blocks of the month. So we've got kind of, probably should count, I think we have 14 different product families that we're shipping each month. And because we're a subscription business, um, everything is the same time each month. So we've specifically spaced things out such that all of our shipments kind of are on a rolling flow. So it's not like every month, the fifth of the month, everything ships out and we're all working towards one date. We're constantly on this hamster wheel. And so it's the fifth, the 10th, the 15th, the 20th, 25th, first Friday, last Friday, right? So we all know those days, but they're all spaced out enough that it keeps us pretty darn busy. Yeah. No, that's ingenious. Again, ingenious to space it out like that. So you have time in between. That's amazing. That was one of my questions was how do you keep yeah. So, yeah. Every time so, we every time we launched a new product, there was a lot of thought given to when is it going to ship? Because we wanted to make sure we had enough time to finish one project, move into the next, finish one project, move into the next. And there are some that, you know, we have to kind of work a little bit ahead on, but we've structured it such that it's not everything all on three days and you burn everyone out and then you sit around for a week. We try to keep everyone just consistently busy throughout. So how do you choose your projects? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so I would say, um, so it's a mix of, um, so projects that we create, right? So we've done a lot of internal creation of projects. Um, it's also partnering with other people that have great ideas, but don't have a platform for which, which to scale it. So our team does a lot of die cutting, a lot of folding, does a lot of packing, a lot of kidding. 
And those are things that not everyone has the infrastructure for. So we can use my team to help scale other people's ideas. And so we've done that. Our, our biggest product is actually partnered with a quilt shop owner in New Zealand. She does design work. We do all the manufacturing and all the commercialization pieces of it. But we found that um, there's a lot of fantastic content curators out there. There's a lot of people out there doing really, really, really good content work but don't have manufacturing and operations to scale. And so we're partnering with them on our non-organic products to scale and launch those products. But it's, it's, it's a good kind of, um, I'm, a, I'm a balanced risk person. So there's always things that we do. There's always things that outside people do. And some of our products we've just done every month for eight years. It's, it's one of those things like if there's our original product that we've launched with, um, we still ship and sell um, a, a large portion of each month. And they always say for subscription products, it's an average shelf life of about two years. And most of our subscription products are going on five, six, and seven, and eight years because people love them so much. Oh, that's a fascinating look behind the scenes. I would not have guessed that just based off of, um, mainly I see your, your company on social media. Mm-hmm. So I would not have guessed that just based off of um, social media presence. That's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, um, we're still, so uh, we're still learning. And I feel like that's one of those things that if we have core values posted of our company. They're on the website. And these are things that all of our employees live, eat and breathe. And each week we celebrate someone who's embodying these core values. And one of them is that we're continuously improving. And I believe that we are always continuously improving. I don't have all the answers. I, I literally don't. And, um, you know, it's one of these, we make a mistake. That's fine. That's fine. What are we going to do differently? And Hey, how are we going to do something differently than we've done before? And so on social media, we're continuously learning, right? That, that we are learning as the platform is changing and, you know, we're still trying to keep up. And so we're, we're trying to find our voice on those platforms. You know, we, we do something and we're like, Oh my God, we put a reel out and it has 50,000 views. This is amazing. And then tomorrow you get like 300 Mm -hmm. and you're like, we did nothing different. This is so frustrating. And so, you know, we try to maintain a continuous improvement mindset on social media um, because there's messages we want to communicate. And then there's what the algorithm wants to communicate about us. And so there's, there's always this kind of tension between the two. I can see that, you know, it's good to hear that larger companies are also struggling uh, with Mm -hmm. the same issues that individual business owners are doing. Like on solopreneurs that's the term i'm looking for that solopreneurs are also struggling with i feel like we're all here in solidarity i mean i i can still remember way back to you know the when it was just me right because there was a time when it was just one person i was one person for i would say probably about the first eight to ten months it was just me and i can remember putting out these social media posts and just getting so frustrated like what am I doing wrong? And then what am I doing right? And I see nothing. I'm an engineer. I see nothing different between the two. I'm like, this one takes off and this one flops and this one's pixelated and this one's square and this one's portrait. And uh, yeah, the, the rules just kept changing all the time. So. All right, Devin, let's pause real quick. So, hi, Andy. Hi. You good? Hello, We're talking Andy. about social, social media a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. So did I get the time completely wrong? Probably. That's okay. We've, 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 we've been recording for about 10 minutes. Okay. So we went over yeah. a little bit of our backstory. I started asking about more business side of the question, or more business questions. Awesome. I'm also losing my voice, so I don't know if it's going to sound too raspy. I can hardly hear outside of the headphones. I mean, I can hear her because she's in my headphones, but like myself, uh, it's been really muffled, so I'm not sure what my voice sounds like. I think you're coming you sound, through, okay? You sound, very, you, sound, you sound very like quiet, like you're whispering, like you're in a library. Oh. But I can, I can hear everything you're saying, Tori. Don't worry at all. Okay. Okay, great. All right. So, Devin, we're back in. So, I have another question. And I know that Cotton Cuts put out puts out mystery quilts, and I was really curious about how you pick your palettes for those. Oh my gosh! Okay, so that that's my part of the process. This is one of those things that even after I think we're seventeen or eighteen, I keep this one. I love picking the color palettes. And so um, when I was thinking about this puzzle mystery program at the very beginning. I did research on block of the months out of quilt shops and usually it's one color palette and you get what you get and you, you don't throw a fit. And it's like, everyone has to do red and white or everyone has to do purple and blue. And I was like, 
we cannot do that at, in our business. We have to give people choices. And so I like giving as many choices as we can possibly financially afford. And so for me, there, I've got a whole process where I actually start with the finished quilts. So we have images of what the finished quilts look like. And so I lay them all out next to each other and I want to make sure that they look different enough, right? The last thing you want to do is have someone do something and it looks too close together. So do they look different enough? And then after all this time, we know like there are five color palettes that we're always going to do because people always love five color palettes. And then every now and then I am always excited by the new stuff. And so like we did a steampunk quilt in one of our most recent mysteries, a steampunk fabric with gears and wheels super popular, right? That was super opportunistic because that collection shipped at the right time and we could actually put it in a design and it made it look beautiful. And so that's, there are things that I can control, right? I can pick the color wheels, the collection shipping, I cannot control. And as much as I want to go to my manufacturers and be like, no, why does it ship in May? We need it here in March. And I could sell so many of that and make so many people happy. Um, yeah, their shipping timelines don't always line up with ours, which is fine. And then, um, you know, with our program, with the Mystery Quilt, we sign up at 7 a.m. on the same Friday twice a year. And some colorways will sell out within 10 or 15 minutes because people just know that they have to get there. Like our website in the early days used to crash. We've solved that problem. Um, I used to like turn it on at 7 a.m. and take my kids to school and go get coffee and come back and be like, oh, go. Like I should not have stepped away from the computer. Um, but it's, it's one of those, we use wait lists, but I can't like go to the manufacturer and have them make more. And so sometimes we get lucky and I can just say, ship us everything you have and we can add more people. Um, but many times like 15 minutes is all it takes. And some of these colorways are gone. That is amazing. I, that's one of my um, dreams for my business is to put something up and have it sell out. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, you know, it happened quickly for us in the first mystery that we ever did. I, again, I was so early. I knew nothing about nothing. And I was like, why don't I just do this, like make this obscene early time and like see what happens. And I think the first time I did it, it took maybe four hours for the first one to sell out. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Four hours to selling out. It was great. We had a wait list. It was great. And then it started getting faster and faster, the bigger we got. And I was like, oh yeah, we're like 15 minutes now. I need to buy more fabric. And so it's just, it's interesting to kind of feel that range of emotions. I was so happy to get to a hundred people with our first mystery quilt. I was like, I set a goal for a hundred. I wanted to get to a hundred people. We shipped a hundred clues that first month. And I was like, this is amazing. Um, we ship about 2,500 of those now. And so like, it's just, it's just my, my scale is all like, it, it's just exciting to be where we are today. But I also appreciate and value the work it took to get to that hundred, right? That was, it was hard. It was a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. And I know we've talked about social media, but I mean, it was me on my cell phone, like messaging people on Instagram, like, oh my God, thank you so much for following us. I appreciate it so much. And it was all that one-on-one -on -one that was just it was, it was a lot of work and it's totally worth it. That was going to be my next question. How did you get it at a high? <laughs> what kind of marketing um, have you done that maybe was a game changer for your business? Do you have anything in mind or has it just been a persistence, consistency type of thing? Right. So early on, right, you don't have a lot of money to do anything. So it's a lot of like grit and just trying things, reaching out to people individually. I think Early on, I recognized the power of word of mouth. And so we did a lot of encouraging people of telling their friends, right? And, and um, you know, hey, getting incentives if you tell your friends. I know there's a lot of software out there, the referral candies, the things you can put on your website, but those feel so impersonal. And I know that if someone forwards me something that's like, hey, go buy here and I get $5 off, I'm, I'm not really going to do it. But if someone in my guild comes with a puzzle mystery, comes with a block and they're showing me, I'm like, I'm excited. Where do I sign up? And we would give them little business cards to hand out to people when they were actually showing it. And so one of the trends we started identifying after a couple rounds of the mystery was we get like 15 to 20% more after we ship the first clue because people get it and they're excited and they tell their friends. And so we never like cut off signups when we ship the first one. I know that's 
kind of nerve wracking for a lot of people because you have to manage that big bolus that comes at the end. But we found it's worth it because people tell their friends and we want to encourage them to do that. We want them talking about what we do. And I feel like the way we went about it is very genuine. It's like it's people telling people. And, and we got that from our customers early on is they would send us emails and be like, I opened my first box and it was amazing. And I had to go to the quilt shop and I opened it for all the ladies that were there. And I'm like, that's what you want. That's like an ideal customer testimonial. And I feel like we, we rewarded, we were lucky in rewarding the right behavior early. That's amazing advice. We tried no. a lot of things that didn't work for sure. <laughs> I can tell you in our first shipments, we um we used to, I, I did these like postcards because silly me thought people would open their boxes and fill out the postcards with like, yes, I liked it. No, I didn't like it. This is what I want to change. And I think we mailed out probably 800 of those postcards and got zero back. Right. And, and it was just something we tucked in the packages because I thought for sure people are going to want to share their feedback with us. Like this is what people want to do. 800 postcards and zero came back to us. Got to keep trying all those different things. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you, um, and or maybe when is a better question to ask, balance the, uh, the very popular mystery quilts with some of your other block of the month, you know, yeah. ongoing projects? We are all, we're still figuring that out. So I was telling Tori a little bit, like we're continuously learning. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting because we're not like a quilt, an online quilt shop, right? If I go to Fat Quarter Shop, I know I'm searching by manufacturer, I'm searching by designer, I'm searching by color, and I am buying yards of fabric. That is not our website at all. Like we are selling experiences, we are selling projects, and we are selling boxes. And so um, it's really it's really important to me that it doesn't feel like a search box and I'm clicking and buying and adding to my cart. There's a lot of education with what we do. And I feel like that element is continuous through everything we do is, is there's an education before, uh, before someone clicks by or someone purchases from us. Now we're constantly evaluating all the products in our portfolio and we've opportunistically added things where we're like, Hey, you know, we see a trend of, I'm going to, I'm going to make this up cross stitch, right? So maybe we should try a couple cross stitch kits and see what happens. We're seeing a trend around embroidery. Let's try that and see what happens. Or, hey, we're seeing a lot of charm packs all of a sudden coming back in. And so we've, we've opportunistically kind of dripped some in. We've also faded some out. And so this summer, I was telling Tori, we have interns on staff. And one of them is doing an entire strategic analysis of every product in our portfolio. And he's going through and he's analyzing. I mean, he's, he's, he's a fantastically smart kid. He's worked for me since he was 15. He knows all of our products. He's in, he's going to college now to get a business degree in finance and analytics. And he's putting together all these like fantastic snapshots of everything we sell and what is the value and should we keep it in the portfolio and what should we think about doing for each of them? And he's finding insights in our data that I've always wanted to find, but have never had time to find. And let me tell you, he is cheap. He is surprisingly cheap and he is doing all this advanced work. Like he's finding, okay, so we know we have this product over here. These people have never bought anything else that Cotton Cut sells. Like that's a huge nugget of insight because to me, we're wasting our time showing them anything else. Like if they like this, then we send them things that are like this. Like there's no reason for us to start trying to, you know, we're wasting our time. We're hitting ears that in eight years have never heard that messaging. And so it's it's really getting us to more personalization, more product specific strategies. And I, I am here for it. I love it. Love that. I love that. that's a great example of uh, keeping track of your numbers for your business. We had an episode on KPIs oh um, and like speaks to like the importance of tracking it. Mm -hmm. No, I am a, I'm a, I'm an engineer business strategy in the corporate world. And so we have a scorecard that we review every week and we track, we track 13 weeks. That's kind of our benchmark. So we can see a quarter at a time. And the scorecard has eight to 10 metrics on it. There, there's some that come in and out, some that stay consistent. We track 13 weeks and we have tolerance bands. And if anything goes out of tolerance, either above or below, the leadership team discusses it. And how are we going to get it back on track? And by measuring it weekly, we can see those. Is it is it consistently? Is it a one-off? Sometimes we have to do more homework into what the number is. But 
we live by our scorecards. I love that. <laughs> That's really awesome. Um, talk to us a little bit about your um, your ambassadors and the the quilters that you've partnered with to uh, you know be those uh, those influencers out in the world on YouTube and social media. Yeah, so I think for for me, right, this is another early on strategy, right? When we talk about kind of what marketing things have you done, and I looked at YouTube and I was like, I'm at like ten years late to building a successful YouTube channel. Like, like that would have been fantastic. And I mean, this was eight years ago. I was ten years too late. It's it's like I missed it, and the the amount of time, money, and effort it would take for me as a single person to build a successful YouTube channel from nothing. I couldn't do it. And so what I did is I specifically went out and I looked for people that had established channels and were doing great things. And I did the cold like, hey, I'm starting something new. You want to get in on this shenanigans? And, um, you know, obviously the big guys were like, they laughed, like squash you like a bug. Like, or they would be like, yeah, um, $50,000 an episode. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have any money. Like, that's not going to happen. Like, hey, I might open and look at your package and I'm going to charge you $10,000. Like, I don't have that either. Like, sorry, bud. And so we found, I found our sweet spot. And that was someone who had a relatively early channel, but had just gotten to like a thousand person success, right? So she, they were starting to build their audiences, but they were eager to try new things. They hadn't quite found a firm voice, but they were willing and eager to invest and grow their channel. And we could be a partner to help them do that. And so um, I remember um, Yvette Niesel, she's kind of our OG ambassador. She was with us from the very, she subscribed to the first box. And I saw her and she was doing all these crazy videos. I was like, this woman's got something. We need, we need to get on board with this. And I remember um, she put out a video and it went against all the rules that you think of for a YouTube video. It was 46 minutes long. She live sewed something on a video, which you never, like you don't live sew something. Like real time sewing was not a thing at the beginning. Her cat was like going like this in front of the camera. Like, like you see cat butt and she was like pushing it. The, the fabric got sucked into the sewing machine like it does for all of us. It was so real, it was so transparent. And in that video, she went from 1,000 to 7,000 followers and she was sewing one of our products. And I was like, that's the voice we need to find is that person that's willing to grow with us and that we can help grow. And so that's been kind of our formula for success is we find people that are you know, willing to try the new things. And we have been very lucky and very fortunate with that. And so we have some long-term ambassadors. We're always looking for new folks to kind of bring into the mix. Um, right. We wouldn't we, we can't continue to do the same thing we've always done and expect to get to a different place. But that's really the formula that's worked best for us is people that are willing to try new things and willing to grow and that we can grow together. So circling back to the fabric and the colorways, um, mm -hmm. kind of tying in with the ambassadors and that idea of collaboration, um, you said that the, the collections don't always line up with your mystery publication dates and things. Um, have you been able to kind of make any of those um, exclusive connections with one or more fabric companies that, because I really see that as a symbiotic great partnership that, like you said, if they could produce just a small collection that fit with your mystery theme, you both would explode. Yeah. So, um, so the, we've gone through that kind of cycle many, many times. And so we, um, we buy from all the main manufacturing companies. And so that diversity helps us get a lot access to a lot more fabric. And um, we are like top 10 customers for most of them, right? Because if we buy a mystery from them, we like we are we are well taken care of by our suppliers. We haven't gone into the custom specifically for us route yet because the minimums to do that means like I wouldn't be able to offer as many colorways as we do. Right. And so I, it's, it's, it's always this balancing act. Um, there, there have been times before where I look at this, I see a color and I'm like, this one's going to be popular. Like print me 600 yards of each print and get it here. Like, like just do it now. Here's the check, like come to us. And um, we have found that minimums 
for custom reprints are coming down. Not every company has that, but they are starting to come down. And so Northcott is working with us specifically on the latest mystery to custom, to do smaller batch custom runs. It used to be a minimum for a reprint was 300 to 450 yards and nine months of a lead time. I mean, by the time we sign up a mystery, nine months, I'm like, this program's over. Like, we're already two programs into the future. And and all of those things are changing. Digital printing is becoming better. Um, eight years ago, it was just Hoffman. They were the only ones that could do it at a high enough quality and color fastness. Now everyone is doing it. Um, batiks, it used to be, again, just Hoffman. Now everyone has their own line of batiks. And so it, there's just so many things that keep changing. We're staying on top of um, but, you know, and, and every now and then someone's like, well, why don't you come up with a, you know, a custom batik stamp that's the Cotton Cuts logo? I would buy that. And I was like, great, we do that for one mystery. And now I have this batik stamp that, you know, what do we do with? And I am always a like, let's make things that can last longer than just a short period of time. But if it, if, if it does come to it, we could potentially do a custom Cotton Cuts. But at the same time, um, we, we started talking with Tori about, you know, kind of scaling and partnering with other people. and the design work is best left with other people. And I would rather focus on our members and our social media and making sure that the customer experience is as great as possible. Could I eventually hire a staff member to do design work? Probably. But at the same time, there's already a lot of great designs out there. If we hit a brick wall, we would definitely look at something like that. But by having as many connections with as many manufacturers as we do, we, we, are always, have, we always have more ideas than we, can actually, than we can actually sell. So yeah. For every creative mm -hmm. person in business, I'm sure they're just uh, the the ideas just keep coming. So yes, um, yeah, yeah. based off of based off of what you just shared, um, my, it kind of follows my next question that I've written down, which was um, your biggest avenue for revenue. We talked briefly about you supporting a shop in New Zealand. So I had I was curious, does your biggest revenue comes from orders from shops or individuals? And I think I know the answer, oh. but I'd love to have you answer. So, um, so we don't do any wholesale. So the shop in New Zealand, she's actually a, a designer. She's a pattern designer. And so she designs the patterns for the mystery quilts that we then die cut and sell. And so, um, you know, we've gone in and out of wholesale a little bit over the years. Um, almost all of our revenue is direct to consumer via the website right now. Um, we did have a wholesale program that we launched um, in October before the pandemic, before like every quilt shop in the world closed. Oh. And every retreat center had to refund everybody money, right? Because we, we, we had this program and we're like, okay, we're going to do this wholesale. And we had purchase orders and we were getting product ordered and getting ready to ship it. And then, nope, we're closed, we're closed, we're closed, we're closed, we're closed. So we had to shelve that opportunity. We haven't gotten back to it yet um, in a post-pandemic world. Um, but I feel like there's something there. But again, I'd have to you know think about how we staff it. I am, I'm a big fan of not having a good idea poorly executed. So I am a big fan of making sure we have the resources to get it done at a high level of quality and that the timing is right. And so when we're looking at interjecting new products, we need to make sure that it's at a time that's right for our customers as well as our employees, because we don't want anyone to get burnt out. And I think we went through a period of like two weeks where I would talk to, I would talk to our members and they'd be like, you guys have a lot of stuff going on. It seems like you're launching something new every other day. And I'm like, yes, we probably do need to slow down a little bit. So how far out do you have things? Like how long is your pipeline for, say, we're, we're getting ready for the Wild West um, mystery quilt. And then do you have like two ahead? Are you a full year, two years, three years out? What's the... <laughs> All right. So let's, let's start with the easy one. So when we get designer fabric in our boxes, we know what's shipping in all of those boxes a year out. So I already know which fabric is going to be shipping in the June 2025 box. Like those orders have been placed. That's a traditional fabric lead time item. That one goes out the door. Um, mystery quilt number one was planned like the week before I opened it for sign ups. Like we didn't have colorways. We didn't have anything. I was calling companies and like, send me whatever fabric you have. I don't even know how this works. Um, for the mystery quilt now, I am starting to review designs for the design that'll open for signups in December and that will launch in February. So, but at the same time, like I've already seen 
an early sketch of the first design that will launch next summer. And so I am usually, I like to kind of see like for Wild West, how do enrollments go? How do signups go? Are there things that people are leaning more towards before I really start putting the pen to paper and start ordering the fabric? Because I want to make sure I still have my pulse on what people are liking and, um, you know, making sure that I'm not letting myself influence the purchasing decision too much too much i learned super early on our first puzzle mr Kill. i was like i love the zen chic fabric this is beautiful this is the most amazing fabric i've ever seen i'm going to order twice as much of this as everything else and that was the least popular colorway and i have learned if i say this is my favorite nobody else likes it so i have to take myself out of the buying decision and so i like to kind of see what people are liking and when we post the colorways there's always people who have ideas and suggestions for what we should do next time. So I like to hear those too, just to make sure we're, you know, keeping our pulse on what people actually like. Yeah. I think a lot of um, people in the design space have had that happen. And, you know, all of us that have tried to launch a quilt pattern business, you know, one person sees it and says, Oh, you should sell that. That's not enough market research to really base yeah. a business on. <laughs> I know. And I feel it, with patterns, right? You have to match it to fabric. And that has such a small window at the pace in which new collections are released. And so there is definitely an art there to making sure that, you know, patterns have life past just a single collection. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and speaking of that kind of staying in touch with your customers and market research and getting that feedback, how much are you on the road you know, we, we just had H and H in the spring and, you know, quilt market is always in the fall. Where do you focus those in-person efforts? So I always go to quilt market. I, I haven't missed any quilt markets in the, the whole time. So we launched October, 2016, and I was at quilt market in October. Um, I am always at quilt market because I am always energized by all the new and exciting things around me. The energy of the people that are opting to go is always very, very, very high. And I went to the very first quilt market after the pandemic where people were like, do we go? Do we not go? And I'm like, I am here for the people that are putting themselves out there. And I want to be in this room with these people. Um, h and H, I went the very first year that they had it. Um, it was all yarn. And I was like, hey, I'm going to check this thing out. I keep seeing notes and things about it. And it was so educational in its first year. Like the vendor area was kind of an afterthought. And I was like, ah, this is awesome. Like, you know, we're getting speakers coming in and talking to us. But like, I felt like it was more an educational conference than a vendor conference. And I had to miss last year and this year. And I'm like, okay, it's turning a little bit, right? It's becoming another quilt market. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm going to let it kind of settle out a little bit because I don't want to be there in the middle of all the negative yarn people that are mad because their show got taken over by all the fabric people. Like, I'm going to let this kind of settle out a little bit. Um, I think, it, I think it'll eventually get to kind of a good kind of stable state where quilt market was. I love quilt market. I love going to Houston. I went to all the spring markets everywhere. There was even one in St. Louis. I took, I've taken my entire team to quilt markets. There was one in St. Louis. There was one in Kansas City. We we go. I feel like I am educating them. They're, they're better because they are able to go to these events. And so um, that's important to me. H&H, &H, I'll, I'll get on the H&H &H bus. I'm still kind of hesitant a little bit. Yeah, it's but, um, um, oh, and still. So, yeah, so that's that's like so I, your question was about how like what what I go on the road for. I'm also early on. I did a ton of consumer shows. And so I would be at quilt shows within probably about an eight hour radius of St. Louis. I packed up the U-Haul and I drove and I got the hotels and I set up the booth. And many times I did this by myself um, because. I mean, these shows, guys, like when you do the ROI, they're not super profitable events um, by the time you factor in all the time and the resources it takes to actually just even get there. And then the booth space is usually ridiculous as well. And so don't think about that too much. To me, I would go and, you know, what is my goal here? Okay, my goal is to tell my story to as many people as possible, collect as many emails as possible, which is still today the highest value I got from any of those shows. And then also just kind of see the environment around me. 
And when you go to a quilt show, you, like I said, you want to surround yourself with the nice people. There are some not very nice people doing what we do. And so, you know, that's been kind of making sure I'm surrounding myself with people that are going where I want to go. And I, and I think that's important in a lot of businesses. There's a lot of very traditional mindsets. Nothing we do at Cotton Cuts is the way everyone else does it. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that was, that was a fun kind of learning opportunity for me when I would go to some of the more traditional quilt shows and see the way things have always been done. So Kim, we have some questions that we like to ask out all of our guests and it's so fun because we rarely have repeated answers. So it's really fun oh. to see the variety of, uh, ideas and opinions out there in the quilt world and the craft industry, uh, but our first is always, what color do you struggle to include in your designs? Oh, green. Like a thousand percent green. Do you want me to explain why green? Yeah. Like, okay. All right. So I thought I was equal opportunity color. Like everyone loves color, right? And then I brought my second child into the world and he wanted me to make him a green pillow. And I looked at my stash and I had no green, like zero green. And I'm like, to, am I allergic to green? Why do I not like green? Like I, I, I literally had to go buy green fabric and mind you, I have a lot of fabric, but uh, yeah, green is the color I struggle with. And I think it really comes down to forest green. Yeah. That's, it's, that's funny how certain yeah. colors can just not, not be your favorite anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, our second one is yardage or pre-cuts. Um, a yardage. Yeah. I, I, I occasionally, like if I'm making like a baby quilt, I'll stock up on charm packs. Um, but I'm, I'm a yardage person. I go into a quilt shop and I, I gravitate towards the bolts and I'll usually be like, I like this. I have no purpose for it. A half yard or a yard, just stock me up and I'll take those home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, I just thought you were going to say pre-cuts because that's the whole basis of <laughs> I, I suppose there's a All difference right. in pre-cut yeah. pieces versus the actual units that we use in. Yes, the so project. I would say you know the pre-cut the pre-cut programs that Cotton Cuts does, does mm -hmm. I love because I can sit and sew. I have no time. I can chain piece those every day of the week. But if you hand me a jelly roll and tell me to make something with it, I am going to get stuck because. And I, I say this on our lives like that's an expensive roll of fabric. Like there is no margin for error there. And I feel like there's a little bit of a pressure when it comes to using them. Like you hand me a layer cake and I can come up with a thousand ideas, but I, I, it's not where I prefer to play. Sure. Sure. Um, your favorite notion. Um, okay. So I saw this and so you, you've raised the bar a little bit by saying there's never a repeat answer. So I'm going to go with kind of what's my most unique notion. And so chopstick. So I have chopsticks by my sewing machine all the time. Um, turning corners, I use them to press. If, if I am short on something and I'm paper piecing, I use them as rollers to press. Like chopsticks, uh, that's one of those things um, for a period of time. Anytime I went to a Chinese restaurant, I'd be like, chopsticks into the purse. And like, so yeah, chopsticks are my, my go-to kind of notion. They, they have such utility. Even they even do. as we're even as we're talking about this, I have this okay. yarn hook that's double ended that I'm playing with, and it just literally sits here, and I use it to roll. So, oh, that's great! Yeah, I love those multi-purpose uh, hacks that you don't have to go out and spend tons of money on the fancy thing. You can just uh, grab a spare set of chopsticks. So everybody, yes. put Chinese food on your menu this week and <laughs> stock up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, what is the most rewarding part of being in the quilt industry for you? I am always inspired by the people around me. And I know that sounds like generic, but I am always energized and inspired when I see cool things around me. Like I love going to market and actually looking at the quilts and seeing just different ways people are interpreting things. I am, I am, that fills my cup that gives me creative energy that gives me joy is just to see really cool things that people are doing and pushing boundaries past what I could have thought when I started sewing when I was 13. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's, I love it too. Just any day that I get to spend with other quilters is fabulous. Um, which leads us right into our next question. Um, who is inspiring you right now? 
Right. So I was thinking about this one and, and it's, it's a hard one to answer, but I actually think um, I am begrudgingly getting on the reproduction bus. And I know that, um, you know, modern, the definition of modern is changing and it's not the Tula Pink and the Cafe and the Allison Glass. It's actually becoming these reproduction designers. And I feel like I am getting on Morrison Co, Morrison Co and like seeing their reproductions and I'll like, okay, I might start picking this up and sewing with it. And, and I was, um, I was um, at an event yesterday and the wallpaper in the bathroom was a Morrison Co wallpaper. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's in my brain. It is sticking with me. And so the fact that I could recognize this wallpaper, I was like, okay, maybe this is the universe's sign saying I should pick up these fabrics and make something beautiful with them. So I feel like, you know, getting on board with the 1880s, getting on board with the, the sages and the rusts, that's kind of what's inspiring me these days. And I don't know, um, by the time this is released, the, the, the cave recolorization of the Morrison Co might be in quilt shops. And so to me, that feels like we're, we're, we got this modern definition shifting and we're now we're bringing them together. And I don't know if the black hole is going to implode on itself when this happens, but I think that is something that I, I want to be able to see and be inspired by. Yeah. I really, um, I like the idea of kind of blurring those lines a little bit. You don't have to have the, like you said, the reproduction people in this corner and the modern people in this corner, and they're not allowed to mix and match because uh, you you can make things work together. Yeah. So that'll be that'll be fun to see how that um, crossover continues to play out. Um, yes. And um, our little fun peek in your world. How many UFOs are in the room with you right now? Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't answer that. So I was, I was doing Tori. So um, we had like, the, the kids were sharing a room and they have since moved into separate rooms and everything in that room got dumped into my sewing space. And so as I look around, I would say there's probably embarrassingly 20 in all sorts of states from, I have the fabric and it's in a bag and I know what project I'm going to make. I'm, I'll consider that a UFO. Like it's an allocated project all the way up to like, it's already basted and I just need to quilt it. And like, why am I not just quilting this already? Just put it in my machine and away I go. Right, right. So um, totally separate from the rapid fire, but you, uh, you're you talking about UFOs made me wonder, um, how do you balance like working on the design projects if you do any of the samples for cotton cuts or, or so along with those events and how much is just purely pleasure, never going to make you know, cross over that line to the business side? So I would say um, it's, it's constantly swinging like pendulum for me, right? And so um, when I think about all the things I've sewed in the past six months, the vast majority have, have been for the business. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, we need this sewn, we need, we need a demo for this, or I'm pattern testing this to make sure it works. Um, or, um, hey, we want you to make one alongside everyone else. We're going to have a sew-in in the shop. And so I'd say in the past six months, it's almost been exclusively business. I went through a period of time where I intentionally made myself participate in Instagram swaps. So that way I would be making non-cotton cuts sewing projects. And so I literally was like, for these six months, I'm going to sign up for three or four swaps. I'm going to make something. I'm going to give it away because I want to not sew for my business all the time. And um, with that said, there's a lot of bleed over. Um, I have some projects on the floor. There's like a Bonnie Hunter one that I'm trying to finish this year. And like every single piece of fabric in it is a cotton cuts fabric. And I know exactly when we shipped it and I know when it was used. And mind you, it's scrappy. So it's got like 300 pieces of 300 different types of fabric in it. But like, it's going to be kind of these like history of cotton cuts quilts. Um, very complex. But I feel like I'm sewing for me with that one. I'm using mm -hmm. cotton cut stuff, but I'm sewing for me with that one because I'm, I'm learning new things as I go. And so I feel like if I'm sewing something and learning something new, it's not necessarily for cotton cuts. That's more for me because I like to learn new things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for that extra little insight into yeah. your process. So um, thanks so much. Remind people where they can find you. Yes. So we are Cotton Cuts. You can find us at cottoncuts.com. We are on all the social medias, some derivation of Cotton Cuts, Cotton Cuts Club. Um, we have a private Facebook group. I think we're up to almost 10,000 people in that group. That's Cotton Cuts Fabric. A lot of fun giveaways, fun things happen in that group. 
We also do a weekly live event. And so every Thursday at 9.30 a.m. Central Time, I go live. Um, we take questions from the audience that are literally handed to me right when I sit down to see if I can be stumped. Um, Paula is my social media manager. She loves to kind of mess around with me a little bit. Um, we always have a topic. We always give things away. What's going on new in the shop? It's just kind of a fun little place to hang out and have fun. And we always give something away. I think that's, that's, that's all the ways you can find us. Yeah. 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 That's, that's great. Well, thanks again so much. And we will chat soon. Take care. You got it. Thanks so much, Andy. I appreciate it. Oh my gosh. We had such a fascinating look at the back end of Cotton Cuts. I'm so glad Kim was able to come on and tell us all about that great, great product that she's been able to put out there. What was your biggest takeaway from our conversation? Oh, my biggest, she talked about so many wonderful things. Um, I think my biggest takeaway is hearing how she scaled her business. She's got, she said 18 employees, I believe. She has a large, a large business and she's successfully scaled it, but she's also kept one of the favorite parts of her business for herself, picking those fabric um, palettes. And she lit up when she talked about that. And that was beautiful to see. And something like, I feel like I could give myself permission is that even though I know I could scale part of this part of this business, that keeping something for myself that lights me up is will still allow the business to grow. Um, for the most part, you do want to make sure you're not bottlenecking, but I don't believe that would be bottlenecking the way she's uh, systematized it. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway? Um, two things stood out from our conversation and one on um, it kind of like you were saying how she structured the operations and things. She mentioned having weekly report cards. So she really has dialed in those important metrics and set up the tolerances, the guidelines for what numbers she wants to hit. And so if she's not on track with those things, she really knows where to focus her efforts. And that is such a great lesson for businesses of any size. I love the way she systematized everything. Everything was in a system and that makes everything predictable, not only for her employees, for her, for the business, but also the customers. So they are like selling out within hours or no, she's even said minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so they, the customers know it's coming. Uh, they know it's coming. Everything is predictable. And that really, I think helps her business succeed having a plan ahead of time and having a system in place. She really talked a lot about oper operations mm -hmm. and I actually have heard a lot about operations, but I think this really illustrates how important they are having operations set for your business. So I yeah. kind of took that over. Did you have anything else to add? <laughs> uh, no, no, that was, that was great perspective. Um, my other key thing that really stood out from our conversation was how she was able to grow through word of mouth that she really has tapped into the power of super fans. And like you said, we've said multiple episodes, you know, listen to your audience, uh, give them more of what they want. And so um, we've, heard from her ambassador program, you know, she'll see someone talking about cotton cuts and she'll reach out to them. So that just, you know, lets the customer do the advertising for you. That's the, the best thing. Um, and definitely something to aspire to is to, to nurture your audience enough that they become your advertising. What a great discussion. If you enjoyed this episode of Quilting on the Side, please leave us a review on whichever platform you're listening. It can be iTunes, Spotify, or even our YouTube channel. And hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our next chat. Until then, remember to have fun in your business and do a little quilting on the side.